you know who I am. I'm Jacques, and uh, I'd like to introduce you with, to Professor Norman Cornett. Now, Professor Cornett is going to actually lead this workshop, and so it's a it's a two evening and it thing, and of course you know you're free to come tomorrow. Uh, it would be amazing if you came tomorrow, but but if not, that's, that's okay too. Um, uh, for the first session, um, I'm going to leave you in the professor's hands. So you're going to have conversations and discussions and, uh, and uh, figure out what the work means to you. And, uh, and I won't be here to listen. And I will be here to listen tomorrow. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mr. Decoto. So that's it? Yeah. I don't need to be here anymore. Um, no. We'll see you later. Yes, I'll be I'll be back at eight or just before eight, okay. so that we can have a chat. Enjoy. Yes, I will. I have tasks to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, the operative principle of the dialogic workshop is this: there's only one wrong question. That's the unasked question. So throughout the time we have together. I encourage you to question. Uh, and this is very informal, unlike when I'm in a university uh, academic context. It's not a quiz, it's not a midterm, it's not a final, it's not an exam, it's not an essay. You cannot crash and burn and go down in flames. <laughs> um, it's a lot more like Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, now Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber, and his Phantom of the Opera, of which there is a song that says, open up your mind, let your fantasies unwind. And that's what we're going to do in a very uh, low-key way. Uh, a dialogic workshop in uh, fine arts is essentially dialoguing with yourself through the mirror of the art, and it's very basic. So, what um, before we start in our first uh, uh, step, maybe you have any questions? Yes, Mark. I have to wait. My first question before we get started, I'd like to know a little more about you. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, I studied French uh, history, uh, literature, and culture. Um, and that led me to be, like Madame, um, a translator and an interpreter. Uh, but then I went into religious studies. I wanted to understand spirituality. I was born in 1950. Things changed. I'm actually from Texas. Uh, Things changed a lot, especially at Berkeley. Uh, and so there was a lot of soul searching. Um, so that led me into religious studies. And how I came as a religious studies scholar to develop this dialogic approach is I realized uh, over the course of my studies for the PhD that here you can meditate, uh, Torah, you can meditate Quran, the Quran, you can meditate the New Testament, the, the Christian scriptures. In fact, you could meditate all of these sacred um, scriptures. But I said, what would happen if we meditated contemporary art as a spiritual exercise? So I started essentially exploring what would what takes place when we allow art to become a mirror of the soul, of the spirit. Um, and then I created certain methodologies um, of, of how to do this. And I do it in many different contexts. I, in April, I was at, working with professor, and professors at the Soba in Paris, because I teach in French as well as in English. But I also do it on native reserves. Um, in Masquashish, which is 90 kilometers south of Edmonton, Masquashish is the community, bar none, in all of Canada with the highest rate of suicide, 
drug addiction, and alcoholism. It's, um, it's quite an experience. And I teach there entirely through the arts in dialogue. And the reason they invite me is because dialogue goes hand in hand with the native mentality of how we learn. We learn in, in talking to one another, in conversing, in conversation, in sharing, in that interstice, that interaction between each other. The whole oral tradition of learning in among native peoples around the globe, you know. So um, that's that's in brief. Um, and I work with artists in all fields. What happened in, with Jacques Picoteau is he had an exhibition in Montreal where I'm based. Uh, until the pandemic, I was all over the place, uh, like at the University of Leipzig or. Um, at uh, Multnomah University or Northern Arizona University working with Navajo Shanto Begay, who is a Navajo shaman and an incredible visual artist. So I like to explore how does the human spirit, spirit express itself? Um, now I have to say, uh, I really believe in the human spirit, but in the same breath, I've never seen a human spirit outside a body. <laughs> So I believe it's very important to make that connection uh, between the, the body and the spirit. And how the body expresses the spirit is very often material in a tactile way through the arts. The arts incarnate the human spirit, give voice, give expression to the human spirit. Uh, this is very much the case with Native peoples. Uh, I've worked with Native uh, artists, activists, and chiefs now for 35 years, uh, whether down in uh, Arizona with the Navajo, or in Masquashish, or or working uh, with the Mohawks in, in Montreal. Um, I also worked with the, the Wendat Hurons in or the Quebec City area, and with the Atikamek, who were about 600 kilometers uh, northeast of Montreal and the Inu. I'm currently translating an Inu poet <laughs> because one of the legacies of colonialism is very often they lose their language. And so it's either French if you're in Quebec, maybe you know if you're towards New Brunswick, the Micmac, or it's English, or in the case of Latin America, it's Spanish. Um, so these are the kinds of, part of what led me to work with Native uh, artists, activists, and chief is as they lost their language, and that's really the watershed among the Native peoples. When I go to Masquashis, for example, the dividing line is those who still speak Cree or speak Shoshone or speak Blackfoot and those who don't. So what occurred in many of the native communities is that with the loss of their own language, they fell back on their spiritual traditions. So this leads me to Jacques de Coteau. I began to realize that just as the natives with whom I work engage in what they call a spirit quest, the artist in their studio engages Likewise, in a spirit quest. And that's why I love doing studio visits. It's like going into the holiest of holies. It's the sacred sanctuary. Because that's where everything that's inside, and therefore precious and deep, um, comes out. So this, this led me to staff to work in those parallel um, tracks of spirituality um, and creativity. Now, I'll just, uh, I'll sum this all up. Why do I work with artists? And how does that relate to my dialogic philosophy of education? And you have to take this by faith, but it's actually the study of doctoral theses and master's theses and, uh, and the like. Um, it has always struck me whether pre-K or post-doc, what distinguishes the human species from every other animal on the planet? 
And I say this as somebody who is now a Canadian citizen, and I've always associated Canada with the symbol of the beaver, and I love those critters. But, and I've gone hiking and seen their dams, but the reality is they tend to build the dams and the dens the same way all the time. But when I walk through the built environment of Toronto, and I'm absolutely fascinated by your neighborhoods and the different structures and architectures, I realize human beings can make a house a million different ways, an infinite number of ways. So really the touchstone of the human condition is creativity, creative thinking, and creative expression. And therefore the task of teaching becomes to what extent can we encourage, foster, nurture, develop, incite to creative thinking and creative expression. And that means you create a lot of space for curiosity. Curiosity is the fuel of creativity. That's why the operative principle of the dialogic workshop is the only broad question is the unasked question. How many times in the university classroom did I see, and myself, I, I lived it too, every one of us is scared to death to ask a stupid question. So nobody questions anymore. Well, how can you learn if you don't question? How can you learn if you're not curious? Now, I'm, I'm, uh, I made uh, the acquaintance of two felines uh, uh, in the Decoteau home. And one of them in particular, who is named after Little Richard's song, Good Golly Miss Molly, uh, which I love because I also work with composers and musicians, that cat is so curious. And once there was an article written about my dialogic uh, approach to the arts and education, and the journalist had the audacity to compare me to a monkey, specifically one called Curious George. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a long-winded answer to your question. Well, and uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually quite fascinated by that. I, I thought you were going to come up with that because of your hat more of an Indiana Jones. <laughs> I love my name. Uh, I do. But uh, uh, that's, uh, I'm sure, uh, I'm looking forward to this evening because I have a feeling it'll be, uh, 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 it'll be, it'll come from exactly what you said. I'm very curious about that. Good show, good show. And Vern, do you have a question you'd like to ask? You've obviously never had a had a body experience. Um, I nearly died twice. Uh, that's as far out of body as I want to get. <laughs> <laughs> but that is not to say, particularly when you work in other traditions. Uh, believe it or not, I, I've had the privilege of doing a series of dialogic workshops, and I encourage you to write his name down. Dr. Ivar Mendez, I-V-A-R-M-E-N-D-E-Z. He's originally from Bolivia. He, and this is no exaggeration, he's one of the foremost neurosurgeons on planet Earth. And believe it or not, he regularly goes to the Amazon to learn from the native peoples. Um, that, that, that intrigues me to no end. And he will talk as a scientist, and I mean, he's really grounded in empiricism, facts and data, pure science. But he says each time he goes among the peoples of the Amazon, he's learning to think new thoughts. I love that. I think that's what life is all about. I mean, all of us here are of a certain age. When I was a kid, born in Texas in 1950, they told us at 65, it's over. Yeah, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, you can't learn languages. We now know through neurological studies that that is bunk. That is prejudice, that is discrimination. That happens to be a form of ageism as well. And the, the irony in Canada 
including right here in Ontario uh, and Toronto specifically, is there has been a demographic shift. The preponderance of our population since 2015 are what used to be called senior citizens because of a very low birth rate. Um, so what does this mean in terms of education? Ironically, the future of education belongs, quote unquote, to the elderly, to the senior citizens. And we now know that as long as we keep doing like we're going to do here, we're developing neuroplasticity. And we can keep learning, and including learning new languages. That's why some people will start taking piano lessons after retirement. This is this is ensuring quality of life in, in every realm. So, uh, but Vern, I sense that your question comes from another space or place, an out-of-body experience. Um, comment. I'm very careful who I talk to. Sure. Except because, um, and I'm saying this with a with a, a great deal of levity. A lot of people think I need to be committed. Um, <laughs> not in a bad way, but they kind of just go, "Yeah, okay, now where's she going?" Um, my lifeline is they told me I couldn't, so I did. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm still doing it. Well, anybody who's in religious studies and is working with different world faiths like Buddhism or Hinduism, if I'm not open to that as a religious studies scholar, I'm in the wrong field, <laughs> quite mm -hmm. frankly. Uh, yeah, I, I work with people who firmly believe in reincarnation and will tell me about their previous iterations and where they want to go in the future after they, quote, leave this body. I think we all have the ability to um, sense things or be aware of things. I believe that most people simply don't listen or don't acknowledge it when, or they're afraid of it. When, and I know this is craziness, I got caught in that storm uh, a week ago, I was out walking, it was lovely, and then all of a sudden, like, it just went crazy. And I was walking up Avenue Road, and there's a Ridley Boulevard kind of cuts from Avenue Road and goes up to Wilson. There's a church on one side, and there's houses on the other, and I'm coming around the corner, I'm thinking, okay, which side of the street am I going to walk on? And I'm thinking, okay, there's wind. If I go on that side, there's a lot of big trees. I could be in trouble, so I'll stay on this side. Well, I walked, and then everything really went crazy, and I was standing against a fence in by some bushes, and directly across the street from me, where I would, would have been, the tree came down. If it would have hit me, I'd get, it would have killed me. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. with I, every hair on my body is standing on it. Um, had I not listened, or had it was just something that said don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, as somebody who's worked with Native peoples for 35 years, let me assure you, Vern, they truly believe in the spirits, and there's a full gamut of spirits. Mm -hmm. And anybody who knows um, uh, the culture of Mexico, and uh, the first of November, and th this, the whole point of learning, I, I, they, they, we've been talking about this because the decotos are quite the travelers. And I tell my students, the best education is traveling. <laughs> because it, it, it impels us to experience what we haven't experienced. So you, you, you two ladies walked in here talking about your trip to Ireland. Uh, it impels us to see in ways we never saw, to think in ways we never thought. Um, so in opening up our mind, and that's why I quoted Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, to see the full gamut of possibilities. Uh, for me, that that's quite quite important. Yeah. Uh, part I, and I do. Any of you know the film by Paul Thomas Anderson? Um, oh, it's uh, it opens. It, it's all regularly about the weather. 
Magnolia. Did you have you ever seen Paul Thomas Anderson's film Magnolia? The whole film, ultimate for me as a religious studies scholar, is absolutely fascinating. Does chance exist, or is there something more than chance? So that's really the question you're bringing up. You went this way, and it had you gone that way, you would have been dead. And Paul Thomas Anderson grapples with chance or providence, chance or fate, chance or destiny. These are what's called in philosophy the ultimate questions. That's what philosophy, theology, and indeed learning are all about. Asking ourselves those kind of questions. Uh, Mr. Decoteau fascinates me because he's an accountant by training. Uh, and he and I did uh, an interview a few days ago in the studio here. And we were talking about spirituality and the arts. And I, I quite frankly asked the host, you know, once I met Jacques Decoteau, I began to ask, ask myself, does it really exist, a spiritual accountant? <laughs> because they're so practical and grounded and concrete and bottom line, I mean literally bottom line oriented. And when I found out that this was his art, I was, I couldn't, this is remarkable. An accountant doing this? <laughs> but you were only informed of one portion, one Part of and we're, we're, we're more than one part, we're multi dimensional, and the other exactly in our yeah, no, yeah, well, that, it, unwittingly, you, you've just put your finger on what our interview was uh, two days ago. That my dialogic approach is essentially transdisciplinary. So, I work with scientists, neuroscientists like Dr. Ivor Mendez, and I work with an accountant like. Um, uh, Jacques Descoteaux, I am, right now I'm curating an exhibition in Montreal with a psychologist. So I believe the human condition by definition is transdisciplinary. What we need to challenge in public education is when we reduce the child or the adolescent teenager or the adult and when we reduce the senior citizen to just this, we're never just that. <laughs> Madame. Uh, um, it's a fun because I had no idea it was going to be. Yeah, that was just. Oh, yeah, well, well, that's what we are going to do. We're, we're, this is sort of the prelude. Think of this as a Rachmaninoff concerto. Uh, my, uh, my son's friend uh, was an accountant, like, uh, oh, yeah. and he became a mama, and now he's a music producer. So, uh, so. The best of both worlds. Uh, I, I don't have a question. I just want to ask if you read the book uh, Enquête sur l'existence des anges gardiens. No, I don't think no. Oh, okay. And who's the author? Jacques Chevalovich, I don't like that. I have a copy. Oh, of yes, yes, I know. He's a philosopher. Is he? Yeah, yeah. That's a fascinating book yeah. about uh, the existence of uh, God and angels, you know, and the battle. Mm -hmm. Experiences about people who almost died and uh, about all near death the, experiences. Yes, and mm -hmm. then uh, all the experiences of uh, saints mm -hmm. who went through, you know, mm -hmm. Dante Pio and this and that. You know. it's, I love that book. What's the name of the book? It's in French. It's the authentication about the enquête. It's the author of Jacques. Pierre Jovanovic. No, I, I think his first name is, begins with a J also, Jean, but I'll have to verify I it. Have, I do not know no, no, not at all. But, but uh, it's in French, so... And you, see, you see, this brings up the whole, for me as a religious studies scholar, every world religion has a mystical vein to it, a mystical tradition. For example, the Sufis in Islam, or the Kabbalah in Judaism. And when you look at the medieval Catholicism, you're going to find a very solid tradition, not least in Ireland, of, of mystics. Um, but I, I'm going to circle around again to Vern's enticing uh, comment and question. 
one of the thinkers that intrigues me the most is Leibniz. Leibniz was a great, great mathematician. He's the creator or co-creator with Newton of the calculus. Um, and he was also uh, somebody who came up with the idea, okay, if evil exists, how can there be a God? If God is all-knowing, all-present, and all-good, how do we come to terms with the evil or what happens to us in our lives? Now, he came up with the idea of what's called theodicy, that this is, in fact, the best of all worlds because of free will. Without free will, we cannot be fully human. We have to be able to exercise free will. Love isn't love without free will, unless you freely engage. But we are really going into a philosophical vein, and there are two people who've never got to say a thing. <laughs> you didn't get to say a thing so far. I'm just fascinated. I'm curious. <laughs> you know, it's interesting just to, uh, to listen and, uh, yeah, to hear what has been said, the questions, and uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm a sponge right now. I'm just overwhelmed, you know, taking it all in, and um, also thinking about how this translates to creativity and then taking the leap of faith in oneself to be creative because you, you know, that's hard sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's really scary to be creative. It's hard to do things that we've never done before, like take a walk through Ireland, like, and things like that, going to the unknown. Um, yeah. I, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, the modus operandi, the methodology, and what we're about to do is essentially intuition, improvisation, um, and the reason I gravitated to this is because the greatest gift a teacher can give to a student is to trust themselves. Because once you get that diploma and you're off campus, what bookstore are you going to go to? What textbook is there for how to live the rest of your life? Well, it takes self-confidence. That's what you want to bequeath to your students. And I believe that comes through developing the muscles of creative thinking and creative expression. I, and because Mr. Decoteau has worked for so long for Honda, uh, in the interview that we did uh, two days ago, I referred to there are basically two approaches to the arts and education. And I'm using uh, automotive metaphors. There's either the brakes that you constantly put the brakes on and you stop people in their tracks, whether in pre-K or post-doc, or there's the accelerator, put the pedal to the metal and let them go. And that's what we're about to do. <laughs> uh, you're, you have not, you're the silent voice in the back of the room, Tom. So it's your turn. It's, this is open up my I didn't even realize voice. you were there. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, just to, to let others know, um, uh, my name's Tom Taylor, and I'm the uh, uh, administrative director for the gallery. And I'm very glad to be here to uh, witness and um, uh, possibly partake in, in uh, the dialogue. Um, and uh, most importantly, to uh, record it. Um, so that it um, has some archival history to it. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> well, I just wanted to know, Professor. Yeah, um, sure. You know, you had mentioned talking about native culture. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say native culture is based more on this, what you call a uh, dialogic approach? The oral tradition is huge. Then you see what's very interesting, Mark, is when you go on to a native community like Musquashish. Uh, incidentally, we often think that new, uh, Im newly arrived immigrants to Canada are the ones who have the most number of children. That is not the case. The native peoples of Canada have the most number 
of children. Saskatchewan has a higher native population than it does a non-native population. And at Masquishish, everybody, virtually everyone has a child by 20, which means that by 40, you are a grandparent, which means that by 60, you are a great grandparent. That is the only way we can understand why they keep talking about the elders. Because the elders are alive and well, and they are the keepers of the wisdom, of the knowledge, and <clears throat> of the traditions. And very often, they've not had the opportunities for schooling. So this is, this is communicated orally, passed on generation from gener uh, to generation. So, uh, <clears throat> would any, before we get going, would anybody else like some water? I'm fine, yeah. but Marie, did you find that me? That's still Gerard. Ah, it's Cynthia. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Gerard, Pierre, oh, Pierre. Oh, actually, it's, a, it's a very, very interesting book, but there must be a translation in English. Maybe, I don't know. So, we, what was the title translated to in English? Investigation about the existence of uh, guardian angels. I think if there is one. Mm -hmm. the, what did you call it? The exploration? Investigation. Investigation. Jovanovic. J O V A N O V I C. Jovanovic. It's a fascinating. J A N O V A N O V I C. Oh. Okay. Yes. So, what sort of J O V A N? J O V A N O V I C. O V. So, before we get into um, our first step, does anybody else like a refill for water? <laughs> or anybody who didn't have water wants some water? I think you need some water. There's a lot of talking. What did you say? That the book was the investigation? Sorry? Well, uh, it's a title in French about the existence of Guardian Angels. Existence of Guardian yeah, Angels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sounds interesting. Certainly, I'd, I'd be Just close to what there is. Okay, so what I've written down, she thinks that it's the investigation of the, of about the, the existence of God and angels. That's, uh, I don't know if it exists in English. I'm just saying that's what it would say. But there might be something on Wikipedia on him or something that we could translate. So we'll get started because time yeah. marches on. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's quite a, quite a prelude. Um, uh, so if with the notebook that you have there, just a few um, basic guidelines. I love working with scientists, including microbiologists, but unfortunately it's very hard on my eyes to read. So if you could write large and legibly, oh. and if you could write in block letters, that's a, that's a dream come true. Would you please write on double space on the pages and only write on what, no, you don't need to tear them out actually. Oh, well, well, yeah. Those are my oh, yeah. And if you write your name very clearly, and today's date, which is the 8th of June on the first page. Now, all, I've, I've done this for 35 years. What invariably happens is that I, I am a bit challenged in reading the handwriting. So it's very helpful if you could leave your email, because if I cannot read what I what you write tonight, I could at least email you. And incidentally, for all of you, I welcome your emails. Mine is very straightforward. Info dot Professor Norman Cornett. And what are we supposed to do? Uh, we're we're going to start in a minute. But but this is the preliminary. Do you want to expect? Yeah. Well, we'll have some example, oh no, you're not having an exam. You're going to be. You're going to have the opportunity to commune with yourself. So you want the date, our email address, and what else was it you want? Um, and your name. Yeah, you're yeah, full. And, and so we'll only write on one side, and we'll write double space. Now, even though. When I go to the you know, different campuses, they've all got iPhones and they've got laptops and Chromebooks and tablets. I always only work with pen and paper. And the reason for that is the hand, head, 
connection. We now know through neurological studies that those children who never learned to write cursively have left entire areas of the human brain undeveloped. And there's another reason for it. Handwriting is the signature of the soul. In my courses, it doesn't matter if there's 70 or 700. I always know my students because I know their handwriting. It's the signature of the soul. So I'm going to ask you to bring your chair. You can use these chairs. And if you would just, each of you get here. And we're going to focus on this. So I'm going to ask each of you to look at this carefully. And now to write one word. The first word that comes to your mind when you look at that. Any word. Don't worry about spelling. We don't care about that. One word. The first word that comes to your mind when you see it, look at it, and write one sentence about it. And a sentence is simply a verb and a noun. It only takes two words. You can write more if you want, but it's not necessary. Just write one sentence about this, and you don't worry about grammar, syntax, or sentence structure, or spelling. Just let it all hang out. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to write one paragraph about this. And a paragraph is si that's just two sentences or more. That's all a paragraph is. Let's break it down. It's just two sentences or more. <laughs> just write two sentences or more about this. So um, don't worry if you're in the middle of a sentence, or as they used to say when I was in elementary school, don't sweat the dangling parts. It's no problem. <laughs> so now if you go down, D dash, and um, there is a school of art, visual art, and also um, writing, creative writing and literature, called Stream of Consciousness. And where do we get that from? Faulkner. Faulkner? Well, he used it. It's true. But first and foremost, it came from Ireland, or that is to say, an Irishman, by the name of James Joyce. Joyce, he was fascinated by Freud and the whole idea of the subconscious or the unconscious, and he wanted to mirror that in his writing. And so, arguably, his foremost book, some consider it the greatest novel in English of the 20th century, other literary scholars says, it's the great, exactly, Ulysses is the greatest uh, uh, novel in any language. Ulysses is about 825 pages. It's in, it happens in Ireland, and it happens in one day, what goes through the mind of this one person in one day? I remember the last in, <laughs> yeah, That's right. I forget the first name. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to let you explore that because I, I often encourage people to go through to, to look for it. So, so the whole book is about what goes through the mind of one person in one day year 1904 in Ireland. And so I'll leave the rest to you. So uh, in, a, in French literature, André Breton and, and Marcel Duchamp in, in, in contemporary art, they were all into this, l'écriture automatique. So now what I'm going to invite you to do is to look at this again. And I, I want to emphasize, do not worry about spelling. We could care less about syntax, also known as sentence structure, or grammar. Everything that goes through your mind when you look at this, please write it down now. Just this, just this. Let me slide me up. Uh, yeah, this is the only one we're looking at. Oh, okay, that's you Okay, just this one. Everything, and just let it rip. 
So we'll stop there for the D dash uh, stream of consciousness. Uh, and if you skip two lines, it go down to E dash. Now, again, keep in mind it's we're double spacing and we're only writing on one side of the page. So if you filled your first page, just go to a new page. And so it's E dash. Now, how many of you have iPhones or Samsung or things like that? <laughs> Everybody does. You do too, Tom? Yes. You have an iPhone? So, E dash is, now, your tweets are how many characters? Now, it what used to be 148. 44, it's, was it 44, 144? I thought it was 148. Oh, but, okay. that's okay. So, it, it, we'll say 144. I'm going to ask you, to write a tweet about this. You can only have 144 characters, oh. a space. <laughs> so write a tweet about this. Do, do spaces count? Spaces count as a character. Because I used to translate tweets. You used to translate tweets? I well, used to. <laughs> the reason I started doing this is because now there are entire novels published only of tweets. So write a tweet about this. Tweet this. Yeah, tweet it. Did you want to call one on the back? You want <laughs> Not on the back, on a new page. I'll write it in French, okay? Maybe it's you, somewhere. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do you have, does it have to be 144 characters? To the best of your ability. Maybe I think it's now longer, but I don't know. I, I think they might have increased it. So don't no perspiration. Don't sweat. Can we do a haiku instead? If you want to do a haiku, go for it. Go for it. Only ten. Okay, go for it if you want. Never want. I never want to sleep that much. The the idea is an economy of means, saying the most with the least, because there is a certain poetry to tweets, and now many uh, collections of poems are in fact tweets. So now we're going to do something else. I'm going to have to do this. I do. Um, there's a great book, if you have a chance to read it, by Angela Davis. Uh, Angela Davis is an incredible, incredible thinker, African American. Um, and it's called Blues Legacies and Black Feminism. And she has an entire chapter on West African culture and the power of naming. That when you name something, you appropriate it for yourself. You identify with it. You establish a special, personal, individual relationship with it. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to name this. What's your name for this? Mrs. Yeah. Number F. Yeah, F dash. What do you name this? Everybody that means something in our life, we have a special name for them. Often we'll cut their name off. It'll be short or we'll add on something. What's your name for this? Me. Do I have to give a title? You give your own name or title to it. Yeah. What do you call this? Now we'll skip two lines. D, right? D dash. This is the stream of consciousness. And again, thinking of James Joyce, the Irishman, novelist, and that's what he wrote in Ulysses. When, when we say stream of consciousness, when you look at this, please write down without worrying about grammar, spelling, or sentence structure, everything that goes through your mind, a memory, a feeling, a taste, a smell, anything that goes through your mind, just run with it, please. When you look at it, what happens to you? So we'll stop there, no matter where you are, and we'll go down to E dash, a tweet. Please tweet this. Write a tweet about it. 144 characters, more or less. Tweet it. 
stop there, and keeping in mind the power of naming, please look at this and give your own title for it. What do you call this? What do you name this? What's your name for it? Can you change your mind? So, before we go on, remember the operative principle of a dialogue and workshop is the only wrong question is the unasked question. We've done two. What would you like to ask before we move on? Are you going to critique this? No. no. What are you going to do with these notes? Very good question, Vera. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Jacques Dehuto, the artist, is present. That's a great documentary. If you haven't seen the documentary, the artist is present. Um, anonymously, I will read out loud to the artist what the participants have written. He will never know. I will never tell him. I do this around the world. And when you have that kind of freedom, and this is one of the big issues in universities right now, censoring political correctness, you can't use this word, you can't say that, um, you're uncensored, unedited, and unplugged. And I, will, I work a lot with jazz composers and musicians. In fact, I'm right now organizing some jazz concerts that will take place up in Montreal in, in July. Um, and this, and, and uh, Jacques de Coteau quite likes jazz, incidentally. That's part of our, di our ongoing dialogue. Um, so I will read out loud, and I'll invite him to riff on it, to improvise, to, to run with it. And then that will be the creative catalyst for our collective conversation tomorrow. And I will never tell them who wrote it. Uh, if the person who writes it wants to say, well, I wrote that, that's up to them. But that's not. Um, my role is essentially um, that of effacing myself so that we build a direct connection between what you've written and the art by the artist hearing uh, your own words. So in other words, we're saying to him on paper what we probably wouldn't say to him face to face. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. In a safe <laughs> way. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, anonymity uh, is very, very important because I saw, believe it or not, I've done dialogic workshops with the Prime Minister of Canada, Paul Martin. And I knew that if I told my students what they were reading, the, I, I gave them, I took, removed the name, uh, uh, his name, and I removed the title of the book, I removed the page numbers, the chapters, and all, I removed everything. Had they known they were writing in dialogue with the Right Honorable Paul Martin, they would have been frozen stiff, scared to death. The whole point of the dialogic workshops is to de- mystify contemporary art, to demythologize the fine arts. Because how many of us are professional artists, art historians, art critics, but art is about communicating. 
And communicating, communication's a two-way street. It's not just the artist saying this, but it's you saying that. So to create a space where you can talk to the art, and in that way, talk to the artist. Now I can, other questions. Now I can tell you some incredible stories of what's happened <laughs> in these. Yeah, but, but, but um, we can communicate with the artist by, by providing this, and the artist can respond, but the artist may not even know himself what he or um, what he may be uh, either thinking or what his prime uh, motivation was. So it may not sink or may not be in sync at the beginning, but he would have to go through a process mm -hmm. almost the same to, to possibly connect. You're quite right. And that's why I mentioned James Joyce and his dialogue with Freud. Freud blew his mind and it changed his, his creative writing and resulted in uh, Ulysses. The whole idea is essentially a dialogic workshop is establishing a dialogue between his unconscious and your unconscious. And then we create this non-threatening environment where we're not afraid to say what we really think about the art. That is, to remove the fear factor is the beginning. Well, that's, that's like with all communication. I mean, we, we meet people, you know, we see people for the first time. We're very guarded. We, we don't let out and we don't let our subconscious or unconscious let out. It takes well, a time period to warm. Indeed. And, and I was intrigued when Vern said that you were the, like your position was the manager of first impressions. Mm -hmm. I found that fascinating because we know from psycho, psychological uh, concepts that first impressions are lasting. So how, how can we move beyond and go deeper? Um, th there's a beautiful, in the Hebrew scriptures, there's a, a song. The Psalms were all songs originally. They were orally uh, communicated and then only later written down. And it says, deep calls unto deep at the sound of thy waters. Really, what we're endeavoring to do is to let the depths of Jacques de Coteau dialogue with the depths of your perception of his art. Um, and that, that can mean you write the good and you write the bad, and you write the ugly. It's got all, it's all fair game. Um, I, it's amazing what happens. I'll give you an example. Um, I, I mentioned that I worked with jazz composers and musicians. I don't know if any of you have ever, ever heard of Branford Marsalis, yeah. but Branford Marsalis won three Grammys before, you know, he's 40 years old. And so I did a dialogic workshop with Branford Marsalis. And I played in, when I do it in music, we go into a place where there's no windows, no natural light. Uh, all, I turn out all the lights, everybody wears blindfolds. And I play the tracks and I give them no title, no, no instrumentation, uh, no composer, no nothing. And then I, we go through this what we're doing. And so I, I had a whole big a group of people doing this with one of Granford Marsalis's tunes. And then he came in, he flew in for, he had a gig, a concert, and we were all seated around. There were a lot of music critics, jazz critics, classical, because he also plays classical music, uh, like his brother Winter Marsalis. And uh, so uncensored, unedited, and unplugged, I wrote with the participants had written in dialogue with one of the tracks. And Branford Marcellus is a very big man. I mean, he's, he's taller than me, he's well-built, he's quite athletic, very physical musician. And this is what one of the participants wrote. And I, these are not my words, but everybody's uncensored, unedited, and unplugged. And one person had written, again, this is them, not me. Who's the prick <laughs> with a big ego and a shiny sax? 
Now you have to understand, I'm reading this out loud. Branford Marsalis is sitting right next to me. There was a collective gasp in the room. You don't talk to Branford Marsalis like that. And he knew the press were in the room. And all these people, well, well respected musicians, and, and there was dead, dead silence. You could have cut the air with a knife. And I realized I had to defuse the situation because nobody had ever, ever spoken to him like this. And I said, exceptionally, I will invite the person who wrote this to identify themselves if they want to. And very sheepishly, a young girl's hand went up. I wrote that. And then he looked her straight in the eyes like a hawk and he said, why did you write that? And she said what? That broke the ice, no longer was it formal, we weren't beating around the bush, we were getting right to the heart of the matter. And he was supposed to be out of there within 30 minutes, he stayed an extra hour. He says, I never get this experience. No one tells me the truth. They're all paid to write these articles. And most of what I read is publicity. I never get a straight answer. I don't get an honest answer. And so we walked after, uh, and then everybody wanted to talk to me. Then we walked down to where he was going to do his concert. And he says, I've got to tell Spike about this. this is the Spike is, is Spike Lee, the filmmaker, because he plays the music on Spike Lee's films. He says, this, I've never had this kind of experience. So he, and he says, I, I, I want to talk to you more about this after the concert tonight. But his concert was totally sold out. There was not a seat to be had. I said, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Marcellus, I wanted to come, but I can't come. But because there's no, there's no seats left. Me. So he pulls out his cell phone. He says, there is now. He says, you go backstage. So he puts me on a chair like this and he's the curtain is there so i'm actually right behind the curtain and they're playing and all of a sudden he plays the very thing that the person who wrote who's the prick with me at a shiny sax and uh, joshua redman who's a great jazz musician was on one side and then uh, there was another one because we all had these special seats. And when he finished the tune, he made a beeline for me. And he said, and his sax, his soprano sax was hanging around his neck. He said, Professor Conan, you go back and you tell them, I mean what I say. I take them seriously. <laughs> because he told the whole audience, this tune used to be called, but I now call it. My big ass shiny sex. <laughs> and this is, uh, and some jazz critics actually published an article about this. So it's when we start talking turkey, we can learn at a deep, I call it deep learning. It's not just memorizing facts, figures. It gets us in the gut. And one of the issues I face in education is what I call Teflon teaching, that everybody studies for the exam, and then when they go out that door, they don't ever remember for the rest of their life what they crammed in studying for that exam. Well, I want to teach for life. I want it to stick with you. <laughs> so that means getting down to the heart of the matter, as the Eagles would put it. <laughs> Yeah. So what I'm finding with this, it's giving me a new way of looking at art. You know, typically you stand in front of a picture and it's very superficial. This is giving a focused thought process of, you know, what's the first word, what's a sentence, whatever. It allows, um, it draws me into the image as opposed to skirting the image and moving on quickly. Um, I wouldn't do it for everyone, but for some, it 
that I might like, where some that I might not like. It would give that introspection as mm -hmm. to what am I taking away from this. I, I'm glad you brought up the, the phenomenon of introspection. You see, what happened in my mind in education is that we outlawed feelings. Uh, they weren't allowed because it's academic, it's intellectual, um, it's got to be rational. Yes, that is part of the human condition. But and let you know what the fifth dimension had a song. You gotta feel it. Let the it's a great song. It sounds like let the sunshine. Unless we feel it deep down inside ourselves, it doesn't stay with us. Um, part of this comes from my understanding of Socrates, the philosopher, who had an expression, the life unreflected is not worth living. So to take the time to reflect on the art, to let it speak to us and to us talk back to, to it. What I see on one university campus after another, whether it's France or Germany, Quebec or Ontario, British Columbia at Simon Fraser University, which I really, really enjoy going out there, and or down in the States, it's what used to be called when I was a kid, the rat race. You just run from one course to another, run from one exam to another, run from one textbook to another. Is that learning? More importantly, is that living? And so, John Cage is, is, a, is a composer that I quite appreciate. Some would say he was one of the foremost composers of the 20th century. And John Cage, an American composer, said, the greatest sound is silence. So I began to realize that what I needed to do in the classroom was to create spaces of silence so that they could reflect and slow down and live and breathe. If you want to get somebody's attention, whisper. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do dialogic workshops with psychiatrists, and that's one of their operative principles. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Or I don't believe that most people want to, I'm going to use the word attached or connected to the art form, regardless of what it is, whether it's the music or painting or whatever. I don't think they want to become um, attached emotionally to it because I don't think they know how to handle it. Hmm. That's a very interesting concept. I hope, I hope we've recorded that. That's one I need to think more. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's a very, that's thought provoking what you're saying there, Bert. I want Thank to ponder you. that more. Et j'ai pas saisi votre nom encore. Marie. 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 Marie Comte. Gunet. Goudet. Gunet. Gunet. Ça s'appelle comment? J'ai eu un truc là. Ah, d'accord. C'est le nom de mon mari qui était turc. Ah, turc, ah, d'accord. Baladur, euh, le, le politicologue français, il était d'origine turque. Edouard, Edouard Baladur, il était, il était turc. So, without further ado, we will move our chairs so that we can focus here. And if you would focus squarely here and look at it, what's the first word that comes to mind? One word. What's the first word that comes to mind when you look at that? Skip two lines and write capital B dash. One sentence. Sentence is simply a verb and a noun. 
You can add a little more if you want. If you could write one sentence about this. Now if you'd say two more lines and we'll go to, we're D, right? Capital D dash. Um, this is a stream of consciousness. Please look at it and when you view it, write down, helter skelter if you want, whatever goes through your mind, a feeling, a memory, a thought, an experience, a taste, a touch, Maybe the risotto in, in Ireland. <laughs> and we'll stop there. If you skip two lines and do capital E dash, please tweet this. Write a tweet about it. Now, if you skip two lines, and I believe we're at uh, we're at F, are we? At capital F dash. What do you name this? What title do you give it? What do you call this? So, we'll stop there. So, then if you'll skip two lines and capital B dash, one sentence. Verb and noun will do. A little more if you want. Please write one sentence about that. And then if you'd skip two lines, write C dash, one paragraph. If you could please write two sentences or more about this. And then we'll go to D, capital D dash, stream of consciousness. Where does this take you? Please go there and write it all down before it evaporates from ever from your mind, from your consciousness. Do like Euripides, leave no stone unturned. And so we'll stop there and we'll go down to, I think it's E dash right now, capital E. And if you please tweet it, write a tweet about it. And finally, I think we're capital F dash. What do you name this? What do you call it? What title do you give to it? So we'll stop there. And before we finish, maybe you have, there, there's one more, there's uh, a lot of last step to take, but before we take the last step, questions, comments, critiques, <laughs> <laughs> That's a fancy word for criticism. <laughs> Were you invited to do this? Or did Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I very much enjoy doing it. I love to there's a French philosopher by the name of Merleau Ponty who said that every perception 
is an interpretation. And what I really like to do is to break down barriers. Is it just the art critic's perception that counts? Is it just the art historian's um, perception that counts? If it's true that every perception is an interpretation, and this is what I do in, I know if I have 100 students looking at this, I have 100 different ways of seeing it. And that enriches the discourse. But they're all important. Exactly. To evaluate the individual. Another, for me, one of the greatest gifts you can give to a child, to an adolescent, to an adult, and this quote unquote, people like myself, senior citizen, is to enable them to find their own voice instead of repeating like a parrot what the professor says. But how many teachers are prepared to accept that? Teachers or? Well, I use the word teachers. Yeah. Instructors, um, educators. Um, yeah, it depends. CEOs. It, I mean, how yeah. many people are prepared to, to actually accept someone else's opinion and actually give it a that's a, that's, a, that, that's where the rubber meets the road, Bert. <laughs> um, and so, really, you see, this is enabling the viewer to have a voice as important as the artist. So, to how do we create a level playing field? between artist and audience? Personally, I think you're asking the impossible. And I'll tell you why. Um, so many people believe that because someone is a critic, of whether it be movie, music, or whatever it is, that because they are a critic and, and respected and so, that they take what they have to say as being valid. Well, it may be valid for them, but it doesn't necessarily make it valid for me. That, okay, that's, that, that's quite fair, and that's one of the reasons tomorrow night, Vern, you see, I wouldn't do this unless we could get it straight from the horse's mouth, and I'm sure you've never thought of Jack Nicolteau as a horse, <laughs> but we're going straight to the horse's mouth tomorrow, because he's the artist. He created this. So I will read it out loud, we'll bounce it off him, and let's see what he has to say. And that serves as the catalyst for our creative conversation. So I believe education takes place when we learn from one another, not just from the prof on high. That's, so therefore, for me, learning is ipso facto a community phenomenon. And this, if I understand correctly, we can ask Mr. Taylor here, but if I understand correctly, this is an artist-run center. So that means that there is, there is a communion and there is a give and take, and this is informing one another. The, the, again, the, quoting the Hebrew scriptures, there's a beautiful proverb, um, iron sharpens iron. This should be a sharpening experience. I can tell you from many artists that I, dealt with, like Branford Marcellus, he found it so sharpening that somebody dared tell him the truth. There, but, but, but was it the truth? Yeah. Well, he considered it the truth. But, so much so that he said it out loud to the entire audience that night. But, but, but he... And of course, truth is a loaded word. Here. Yeah. The, the, the process that you're doing, that uh, we're doing, uh -huh. okay. um, it's really a process where we are building up our perceptions, which are great, mm -hmm. but we're also minimizing, we're putting the artist in a position of minimizing his opinion, meaning we're challenging even his opinion, and he's the one who created it in the first place. Well, I wouldn't do this unless we could meet with the artist. Yeah. I never do it unless I could, we can meet with the but, artist but, themselves. But, but what we say from a quality point of view, what we say may not even have value. You'll find out tomorrow. That's the only, and until we start talking to one another, we won't know. So it's to open up that dialogue. 
I don't think Jacques would have done this if he didn't value what was going to come out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we've done it before, actually, largely in French uh, in Montreal. I mean, it's the artist, I, to your point, Mark, this is taking a risk because he, I, I don't know what you've written, but he could hear the good, but he could just as well hear the bad, and he may even hear the ugly. <laughs> But that's the way we learn. We learn that this is, this is essentially the art school of hard knocks <laughs> because it could sharpen. It's, it could prove a sharpening experience. This is not for every artist. So uh, it, you be, it's interesting that we began, um, almost began this evening with a comment that Vern made about out of body. Now, believe it or not, there's an incredible poet who lives not far from here. He's Professor Bruce Myers. He wrote a book published by Harper Collins that has become the gold standard. In fact, it's called The Golden Thread. So he came up to Montreal and we did a dialogic workshop based on his, at that time, his latest book of poetry. And at one point, he stopped in the middle of the dialogic workshop and he told all the participants, he says, this is an out-of-body experience. It's like I'm up there and I'm seeing myself here and I'm seeing my words come back to me in a new way. Mm -hmm. He had never experienced that. So it's, uh, it, you, you, perhaps you've seen the film, um, the Color Purple um, by Alice Walker, who just celebrated her, her birthday. Marvelous, marvelous author, lady, African-American. But she wrote a wonderful essay, When Our Words Come Back to Us. This is a way that the artist creativity can come back to them and bounce it off them. Essentially, when I do these, it, like if I'm an entire course or seminar, we morph into a think tank, a think tank on art. And we're learning from one another. It becomes creating that kind of dynamic where it's not a one-way street, but it's back and forth. A, I call it a synergy, creating a synergy between the audience and the arts. But the, none of this is scripted. I have no idea what you've written. I have no idea what kind of mood uh, the artist is in tomorrow. Can, are, are they in a place where they can receive it? We're going to find out. So, but unless we take the risk, we won't know. So the process is you're going to edit these. Oh, no, I don't edit. I, I'm just going to read them. And you're reading every, all of them? We'll see. But you see, what I'll do is I will start reading, and then I will invite the artist to riff on that. And then if then the other people say, okay, well, I, I have something to say about this. I don't know if any of you ever, uh, as a school child, uh, I mean, this is what, this must have been about second grade. We used to, they used to read stories, you know, like Sea Spot Run and Jane and all this kind of stuff. But there was a beautiful story that has stuck with me and actually has become a philosophy of life. Have you ever heard the story about nail soup? There's a village and nobody has any food. And they say, okay, well, uh, well, we'll just boil water and I've got this rusty nail and I'll just put it in there and at least we'll have broth, we'll have colored water. And if you have anything to throw in, you throw it in. And of course, everybody had a little something to throw in. And by the end of it, they were having a rich, hearty soup because everybody had contributed. When everybody contributes to art, then it's mission accomplished. As long as it's only, and, and I, I really appreciate uh, what, what you had said. Part of what led me to do this is I realized people walk in, nanosecond, a glance, yes. and then they walk out. But each of these works 
is the result of an entire process. So this is a way of recreating the process of going how, uh, I don't know if you're, well, you probably all know Sesame Street, but in, in before there was a harmonica playing, how do you get to Sesame Street? I love that song. So I always ask, how do you get to Sesame Street? And I actually invited the harmonica player of, of the theme song of um, Sesame Street. And so for what, one of the biggest questions I have is, how did, how did the artists get there? How can we tra retrace their steps, the steps of the creative process? That's why we do this. And so this will in create a space where you go through his art and he can go through how he got there in dialogue with one another tomorrow. Time. Yeah. Goes fast. Any other question, comment? Critique. No. Did you, did you choose these pieces in advance, maybe in collaboration with uh, Chalk or? No consultation with the artist whatsoever. Or were these just random pieces that you just said? This I came this here. Way. I came here twice, mm -hmm. at least twice. Um, actually, Monsieur mm -hmm. Decoteau and I were supposed to go visit a number of galleries today. Um, and I said, no, I want to go back. I want to go back to Propeller. Um, I like to let the art sink in, to assimilate. I want it to come to a point where I can never forget it. It becomes part of me. So I, this process is a way so that the art can, can become part of you as participants. Other questions, comments, critique? I think the artist will actually come back any moment. So we were going to do a last one, but it looks like uh, I think we've run out of time. But we still have time for questions, or comments, or critiques. Which was the other one that you're going to do? <laughs> I won't tell you unless you're willing to do it. If you're willing to do it, we'll do it. It's OK. <laughs> OK. But this was not an exercise of critique, was it? I thought we should start feeling like a, we are not going it, to judge the painting. You have the right to do anything, to write anything you want. No, I know, but I feel that we have to yeah. do that, you know, yeah. but to judge but, just a feeling which is different. Yeah. Totally, totally. And how often does an artist, other than if they read in certain journals or, or periodicals, now and then the newspaper, how often do they really get to hear what everyday people think of their art? The average Jane and Joe. No, no. That's, that's what communication is about. And art, first and foremost, is a form of communication. I often make the distinction, if it doesn't communicate, it isn't art, it's simply an object. Art communicates. It says something. So why don't we create a space where you can say something back? You can echo. You can mirror. Any other questions or comments? So if you make sure on the very first page, your name is there, the date, and above all, your email address, Oh, oh no, don't tear them out, please. No, no, this is, don't, you don't need this. Oh, all that, that's for something. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, but, you but, but your name is there. Okay, great. And thank you very much for participating. If you have any further questions, uh, I believe it or not, I don't have an iPhone. I don't have a cell phone. I have nothing. You have a shop that could do it. Okay, you can't get in. So just email. <laughs> In, info dot professor norman cornett at gmail.com and the artist is present <laughs>
Thank you very much. Ah, sorry, it was yeah. info at info dot Professor Norman Cornet. Cornet is C O R N E W T. Yeah. Info dot Professor Norman Cornet all together. C O R N E W T is in Thomas. C O R R N E T T. Thank you. At gmail. At gmail.com. And uh, Mark is quite right. Mean, you mean like uh, the the trumpet or the, the, the brass instrument? So, of course, in the locker room in high school, I was called Norm Horn. Horn. <laughs> which is, which it wasn't necessarily endearing to me. <laughs> yeah. So if I could get the notebooks and you see, I made a decision as a professor, instead of having the students buy the textbook or the course pack, they would write their own. <laughs> and that's what you did. And I hope we'll see you here tomorrow evening, same time, same station, and feel free to invite friends. It's very much like that, the, the rusty nail soup. The more each one of us puts in, the richer the broth. <laughs> so tomorrow, what, what's going to be tomorrow? Tomorrow, I will read out loud, anonymously, what the participants... You have to translate in mind because it's French and English, I mixed the two. Oh, that's fine. Which that's is beautiful. beautiful. That's no, we, we won't know it's you. <laughs>